You see that spinning object in the back of the helmet of this guy? The purpose of this technology was never described in the movie. But in the novel, it has been described that the Baron military used to have a built-in cooling system in their military suit. So, there is a higher possibility that the purpose of the spinning object is to cool down the body temperature of the people inside it. If you take a close look, the demolition crew are using a separate fuel tank for each flame gun for burning the dead body. If you look far away, you can also get to see two more people using separate fuel tanks as well. In the meanwhile, this guy over here is also using a flame gun, but the firing probe was not connected to any fuel tank. So how can you generate fire without using any fuel? It doesn't seem logical, you know, unless they have an emergency backup system inside the gun itself. Why does the eclipse of Arrakis look like the logo of Batman in the middle of the process? If you zoom in, you can notice that the sun of Arrakis is getting behind not one but two planets. The planet to the left side is smaller in size which has coincidentally made the eclipse look like the logo of Batman. If you watch the movie with close observation, you can find out a better view of the solar eclipse in another scene. If you zoom in the picture on the reflection of the visor, you can find out a man holding a middle-sized camera in his hand. I guess the VFX team forgot to remove the cameraman from the reflection on the visor. Don't worry. You see that gun in the hand of Stilgar? It actually doesn't belong to him. It belongs to Paul Atreides. In the end of chapter 1, this gun was taken away from the hand of Paul. Give it to me. The first time when I saw Lady Jessica vomiting on the ground, I thought the vomiting was because of her pregnancy. But later, I saw this guy throwing up inside the ornithopter. At least this guy is not pregnant, right? So, I have a guess that the combination of harsh weather, extreme heat, and consistent exposure to spice gave them the feeling of nausea and their body reacted to those changes in the environment. This is the vision of Paul Atreides and you can see the skull of Leto Atreides over his picture. And guess what? In chapter 1, Paul Atreides actually said that he was able to see blinded followers waging a holy war at the shine of his father's skull. Fanatical legions worshipping at the shine of my father's skull! A war in my name! When Paul Atreides was scuffling with this man, the other guy was slowly and slowly catwalking to the direction of Shani. What a bloody retard. This guy still continued his catwalking when Shani pointed the missile directly to his chest. And then he doesn't have a freaking gun in his hand either. How can a special force operative become so much idiotic in a hostile area like this? You see those parachutes? If you flip the picture and look at the footage again with an intrusive mind, you can find something else over there. You know what I mean? <laughs> when Stilgar was coming back to take some rest, he was sand walking to avoid attraction from the sandworms. But he was not within the territory of the sandworm. The territory of the sandworms begins from the other side of that terrain. If you also zoom in, you can find out that Paul Atreides was not sand walking over there at all. So, what's the point of sand walking to come back when it is not even necessary? It's not like he was training over there. He doesn't require training anymore on this thing does he? I really don't understand exactly how do they get off from the back of the sandworm. According to the novel, the sandworms in the desert never stop for the rider to get off. Which means you literally have to jump off from the back of the sandworm when you have come to your destination. If this is true, how did the Fremen people get off from the back of the sandworm? How can they take a grown-up woman inside this litter on their shoulder and then jump off? All of these people are supposed to be crashing on the ground because of the speed velocity impact when they jump off. This entire concept doesn't make any sense to me.
All right, I have an intrusive thought over here. If you live in the desert, the sand is going to get inside every part of your body. When I say everything, I literally mean everything. So Paul and Shani didn't have any kind of discomfort when they had been doing that thing? I mean, I'm just curious, you know? Did you notice something over here? This guy belongs to the Baron military and he didn't die in the hand of any Fremen warrior. Instead, this dude had to die because of friendly fire. The other guy literally shot him in the chest with his laser gun after confusing that man with the Fremen fighters. Very special day, the Baron fade. What the hell kind of dress is that? It neither looks like a bra nor like a t-shirt. What the hell? In the movie, it was portrayed that the Gady Prime planet has a black sun, which means the planet is dark all the time. So how is the gladiator arena so bright during the fight? If you have seen the movie with a close observation, you can possibly find out this object above the gladiator arena. This is a levitating glow globe. You can also find a smaller version of it inside the house of Paul Atreides as well as the palace of the Harkonnens. These are used for illumination purposes only. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What the hell happened in the back of the head of this man? Is there any way he was playing football and the ball got stuck in the back of his head through his mouth? Guess what? Fade Drauta Harkonnen died in the exact same way in the hand of Paul Atreides, just like he has killed Lanvile Atreides. <gasps> <gasps> following me. If you zoom in, you can find out that Rauta Harkonnen has kept the sharp edge of his knife outside and the unsharp spine of the knife on the throat of Lady Margot. And it shows clearly that he didn't have any intention of causing any harm to this woman. If she was not a Bene Gesserit, this son of a bitch would have slit her throat a long time ago. Yo, what the fuck? When Paul Atreides was giving his hand to pull up Gurney Halleck, the other guerrilla fighters still had been rushing to strike the men of Gurney. These people didn't even have the common sense to realize that they should stop it for a while until Paul Atreides gives them the permission to engage. It's my feet, brother. People call him Beast Raban, the former head of the Baron military. And then this guy couldn't even manage to defend his ball sack from a simple kick from Rauta Harkonnen. Also, in the end of the movie, this guy died in the hand of Gurney Halleck after two seconds into the hand-to-hand -hand combat. How did this guy even get the name Beast Raban? Even a mini mouse can last longer in a fight than this cue ball. Kiss. Have you noticed one thing? Whenever the Harkonnens would become angry or sad, a lot of saliva used to drool down from their mouth. Let me show you another scene. <laughs> now in the novel, there is no mention of the Harkonnens drooling saliva from their mouth. So I really wonder what is the reason behind that? When Paul Atreides drinks the water of life, he gets access to the ancestral memories of both males and females. But you can only get to see the glimpse of the female ancestors over there. Why did he not get a glimpse of his male ancestors as well? He also inherited their memories, right? This is not a good depiction, you know? This is the vision of Paul Atreides and you can find his future sister standing on a desert beach in front of the ocean. Now, I would like to tell you that the planet Arrakis never had any ocean or any other kind of water body. So, if this footage turns out to be true for Arrakis, it will be an inaccurate depiction from the novel. And I hope the director will not make that mistake. There is a narrow way through. Did you see something? When Paul was visualizing on how to become the Emperor, he saw the vision of his duel with Rauta Harkonnen in the end of the movie. Which means Paul Atreides knew from the very beginning that Rauta Harkonnen is gonna die in the duel. But it seems you've won your battle.
You see those inscriptions on the face of Lady Jessica? I tried real hard to translate these words into English, but the actual novel doesn't have any extensive explanation or depiction of the Chakobza language, so I couldn't manage to find out exactly what was written on all over her face. My three hours of research got dumped into the toilet. You see the sunlight over there? There is a cross-shaped gap over there on the roof allowing sunlight into the room. On the other hand, Vladimir Herkonen and Emperor Shaddam had been the center of this conversation. And guess what? The sunlight in the middle covers the position of both of these characters entirely. I have to say that the set design of this movie was really amazing. They decided to design the roof in a way so that we can have a better and brighter visual on both of the characters. This guy literally launched three atomic warheads to break the shield and then they invaded that place coming on the back of the sandworm. Surprisingly, nobody, literally nobody over there showed any sign of any reaction from the radiation of the nuclear device. Now just don't tell me in the comment section that these people are totally immune to the radiation from the nuclear devices. <gasps> You see that? He used his right hand to push the knife of Rauta into his right chest for confusing him. This guy for a split second was both confused and believed that he has finally won against Paul Atreides. But in the meanwhile, Paul with his left hand stabbed his knife into the heart of Rauta and killed him. That was a genius move. There are no sides, Reverend Mother. Alright, are we never gonna see this woman getting her skin peeled off and thrown into the desert so that the insects can devour this bitch when she is alive? This would be a great idea, you know? This woman is Loki, the biggest villain in this movie. She had been pulling the strings of every other characters from different houses from the very beginning. This woman deserves a painful death, and I mean it. Rid me of this Fremen demon.